OK, let's compare answers. Question one, why does it begin with this quote from Dante? Why is it not translated? One group took this question. And uh, they believe, starting from the second part, that it is not translated because the original language is the most accurate. Every translation has its own bias due to the translator's own ideas. So if the poet really cares about the idea of this quote, uh, the best thing to do is to not translate it. And I do, I do think that makes some sense. Um, but we can also think more about why he chose this text. Why did he quote from Dante's Inferno? Um, so the most direct way to think about this is to look at the <laughs> translation that the textbook gave us uh, in footnote two. Uh, I will give you a simple version, which is uh, this is being said by somebody in hell and he meets Dante and he says to Dante or Dante asks him like, what is your story? Why are you here? And he says to Dante, you know, I I don't like to talk about my story, but nobody escapes hell. So you're not going to go back and share my story. Therefore, I will tell you. Uh, and so as the group who chose this question observed, it's about a secret or the idea of a private life, a private uh, life history. And so that applies to this poem as well. The entire poem is about this dude, J. Alfred Prufrock, thinking and hesitating and worrying. It's all about what he thinks and what he feels, and it's it's not a very positive attitude. Uh, some other groups called him like pessimistic or like hopeless. It's not something that he would want to share with other people. So the whole poem is kind of like what this guy in hell says, right? I wouldn't share it, except I know that you're not going to share it with other people. So I will tell you. It's it's humiliating, right? He's in hell. He had to do something bad to in, in order to end up in hell. It's humiliating. Um, but that brings us to another possible reason why T.S. Eliot began with the Inferno. The Inferno is the story of the main character walking through hell and, and talking to everybody there. So it's also kind of saying that J. Alfred Prufrock, who we are only talking to for three pages, is kind of in his own personal hell. He is suffering from his uh, crush on a woman. He doesn't think that she will love him. It's very painful. Uh, so reading this poem is kind of like visiting hell and talking to somebody who lives there, namely Prufrock. Uh, and then finally, there might be one more possible reason. Dante's Inferno very famously begins with the character Dante saying that one day in the middle of the day, he found himself lost in the woods, in the forest. Uh, and then he you know, discovers a cave and he enters hell. But the point is the middle of the day, many people, most people take that to mean the middle of his life. So he's in his middle age and he's kind of stuck or lost in his life. Kind of like the main character of this poem, right? He's also middle aged. We will talk about his physical appearance in the next question. And he's stuck in between should he or should he not uh, confess his love for this woman? He's also stuck in the middle age of his life. So that's the first part of the question. Why Dante's Inferno? Uh, why is it not translated? Uh, the group said because it is most accurate, which is true. But there could also be more reasons. Um, in those days, more people in America and the UK 
understood Italian. And if you study a European language or any language, in those days you were supposed to study the classical literature to learn the language. And of course, Dante is very classic Italian literature. So anybody who tried to study Italian would recognize Dante's Inferno. Um, even if they did not get to, what is this? Book 27, line 61. This is already quite far. Each book, ha uh, each volume has 33 books. So this is already pretty far into the book. Even if they didn't get here, the Inferno or the entire um, uh, Divine Comedy, the three volumes, uses a very special rhyme structure. Uh, it's Italian, so I don't know how to read it, but you can see, right? Line one line uh, rhymes with line three, line two rhymes with line four, and then the last two lines rhyme. This is a very unique rhyme structure that Dante uses through all 100 books of the Divine Comedy. So even if the reader does has not read up to this part of the book, he or she will recognize that it is from Dante. Um, but of course, more people back then would be able to read this and, and uh, they would not need this footnote to explain. Uh, it is classic Italian literature. And we know that Eliot was born in the US, but later went to England because he felt like he needed to recover a sense of tradition. The United States is famously a very young country. Uh, a lot, most of its history is kind of like self-invented, uh, self-mythology. It doesn't really have a long history and tradition. And that is what Eliot wanted. So he instead went to England. He joined the Church of England. In fact, he later even became a Catholic, because he really needed that sense of a solid culture and religion in his background. So the idea of using this classic work of Italian literature would be very appealing to him. He would like this very much. And then one more possible reason is because T.S. Eliot was one of the so-called high modernists. Uh, and we talked about how modernists didn't really like to explain everything. They like to make their readers work to understand. You need to put in the effort in order to get the meaning and the experience of this literature. So even for people who did not understand Italian, Eliot didn't care. He's kind of like, if you want to understand, you have to work out what this means. So he would hate this footnote right here. He would think that it's ruining his entire purpose. Um, in some of his other work, he added his own footnotes, and the footnotes only made things even more confusing. They added other stuff that's not related to the poem. The footnotes themselves were in different languages. It's a mess. So uh, that's also part of Eliot's style to use different original languages and not really try to help you understand. So that's question one. Moving on, question two. How would you describe the speaker, J. Alfred Prufrock, physically and mentally, and what evidence do you have? Uh, this was today's most popular question. So let's see what some of the groups told me. They first pointed out, line 40, with the bald spot in the middle of my hair. So this tells us that he's probably not a young man anymore, at least middle aged, maybe slightly older. Then it also describes uh, how he wears his clothing. My morning coat. Um, back in those days, people wore different clothing in the morning, in the afternoon and in the evening. So his morning coat. My collar mounting firmly to the chin. So his coat is is buttoned up tight all the way up to his chin. Um, it's not very stylish. And also it shows that he's kind of afraid of life. 
he needs to protect himself. He feels like he needs to protect himself. Next page, we also have a physical description, line 44. How his arms and legs are thin. So he's not a physically very strong man. Uh, maybe he's like an office worker, right? Who doesn't get a lot of exercise. And then line 43, again, clothing. My necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. So his tie is, he says, rich, like the color is rich, the quality is good, but it's modest. Uh, the opposite of a modest tie or clothing is we say that it's loud, han cao. Like you can think of clothing that's very colorful, and when you look at it, it kind of hurts your eyes. We call that loud. So his tie is not loud, it's modest, but it's a good high quality. And also we know that uh, if you wear very formal clothing, your tie should have a tie clip or a tie pin. Uh, the tie has two parts of the front and the the back. There, there's it's two pieces to the two ends of the tie. So like when a man like bends down right to prevent the tie from flying everywhere, he should pin the tie to his shirt or clip it to his shirt. So that's a tie pin. And he says that it's a simple pin. So again, a high quality tie. But it's not very loud. It uses a simple pin and it's hidden under his morning coat, which is buttoned all the way to his chin. And that is a good symbol of how he feels about himself. He feels like there is something valuable and important deep inside him, but he's afraid to show people because he's afraid nobody else will agree. So he hides that part deep within himself. And this is connected to, of course, the mental uh, description. Throughout the poem, he always keeps asking, do I dare? Or near the beginning, he says, I have an overwhelming question. But he doesn't tell you what the question is. He's so afraid that he's afraid to tell you the question let alone the answer. Uh, and he keeps asking questions and he keeps finding excuses not to uh, confess his love, right? How should I presume? Which means how can I assume that she would want to hear me say that I love her? How can I assume that she would love me back? Um, so it's also showing us how he's uh, hesitant, nervous, unconfident, even afraid of his situation, of the woman, of life in general. One of the groups said he's afraid of life. Uh, and I think we now have a, a better picture of this person. Simply from his description, his body, his clothing, and his actions. Question three, who is the poem talking to? Who is the we at the end of the poem? Why do you think so? In other words, again, based on what evidence? Well, maybe not evidence, but give your reasons for your answer. So first of all, the addressee, who is the poem talking to? Let us go then, you and I. Already there's a you, so who is this you? And then line 11, do not ask what is it? Don't ask me what the question is. Let us go and make our visit. So it seems like the you is maybe a friend or a companion. And uh, this you does not seem to be as afraid or unconfident as Prufrock is, because Prufrock is not willing to tell him the question or tell you the question, but you looks like is going to ask what is the question. So this you person seems to be a bit more 
let's say, normal. Uh, and then the U kind of disappears for a while. It's mostly just Prufrock asking questions, but now we have the picture that he's asking them to his companion. Every time he says, do I dare or how should I presume? He's asking an actual person next to him. And then by the end of the poem, it says. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea. Chamber means room. Uh, under the sea, rooms are probably like caves, right? Don't shit. By sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown. By here means next to. Sea girls is referring to the, uh, where is it? Mermaids earlier. Wreathed means to wear on the head. Uh, like a like a laurel, guiguan, like a, a circle of of plants or flowers, wreathed with with seaweed red and brown. So it's my it's my orange and red hair, this hair, this hair, I should say. Till human voices wake us and we drown. So it's like he's dreaming, right? And then once he is awakened by humans, he realizes he is underwater and so he drowns. Uh, it's kind of like the one of those like cartoons, right? The you you guys seen those cartoons where like the animals are chasing each other, right? and they keep running, and then they run into the middle of the air, and only when they stop and look down do they realize that they're in the middle of the air, and then they fall. That kind of idea. So by the end we have the we. We start with you and I, then we get I, and then finally we have. We in English, we has many meanings. Uh, we can include. The other person or it could just be myself in Chinese also, right? If I say. Uh, like if I'm talking to, to uh, two of my friends and I say to one friend. We should go have lunch. Am I including my other friend? We don't know. We can have both meanings. Uh, or we can even just refer to myself. Uh, like uh, Taylor Swift once had an interview where the interviewer asked her, do we know when your new music will come out? He used the word we. And Taylor said, uh, we don't, but we do. So we can talk about everybody and we could also just talk about yourself. So there are many possibilities for this word. Who is we? Um, one group actually did take this question. Uh, and they believe that this we is everybody who feels the same way as proof rock. So everybody who feels like they love somebody that will never love them back and it's hopeless and it's hell is included in this we. But we can also think a bit deeper about this because the poem does begin with you and I, two different perspectives on this situation. And we know that his companion feels differently because his companion is willing to ask the question when Prufrock is not. But by the end, we only get one we. So could it be that Eliot, the poet, is implying that after reading the whole poem, you should be able to better understand the kind of person that Prufrock is. You should be able to feel his suffering. And so even if you yourself have not experienced it, once you understand this feeling, you are also included. I and you now becomes we. It's possible. Um, but we should remember that this is a very clear choice. Eliot chose to end with we. Uh, and like many things in his poetry, there is no one single answer. So it's interesting to think about the different meanings, but I think at the end of the day, each reader should decide for themselves. 
does this we include me? I was talking with this group and um, we also mentioned the fact that maybe diff uh, readers from different genders might feel differently. Elliot was a man, Prufrock is a man. He was writing for male readers. Maybe women would feel differently about the character and about the situation. Or maybe women would, even when women have similar experiences, they might have a different reaction or a different feeling. I don't know, we can talk about that later. Number three. Oh, that was number three, sorry. Uh, number four. Why are there so many descriptions of outdoor and indoor environments? OK, so um, nobody took this question. So I'll take this question. Last week we already talked about the second stanza, right? Describing the streets, describing the cheap restaurants, describing uh, how the city, it, like, it's like the city is working against you. So that kind of uh, describes Prufrock's emotional state. He feels like the city is empty and he is alone. He feels like he's eating at cheap restaurants. He's leading a very low quality life and he does feel like the city is working against him. Uh, and then in this stanza, we continue with a description of the air and the water. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. A window pane is just the, the glass part of the window. OK, so fog, we know what fog is. Why is it yellow? It's yellow because of air pollution. This was early 20th century. I'm going to say London, I think. Uh, in the big city. The air was terrible. It, the air is still not very good today, right? But back in those days, it, it would kill people, literally. And that's actually part of why we have better air today. In the 70s and 80s, countries started realizing that the bad air was literally killing people. And so they passed new laws to restrict the kind of air that could come out of machines like cars and, and homes and factories. And that's why the air has gotten better. But back in those days, there was none of that. So it was so bad that the fog was yellow. Uh, and it rubs its back upon the window panes. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes. A muzzle is uh, like a dog's mouth, like a goldsway, right? Like a, a pointy mouth licked its tongue into the corners of the evening. OK, so we do have these words, right? Rub its back, its muzzle, lick its tongue. It's comparing the fog to a dog. Yellow fog to a yellow dog. But in this case, it's not one of those cute dogs. It's one of the, those stray dogs, Yego, right? Running around the city, uh, wreaking havoc everywhere. Uh, we usually consider stray dogs to be dirty and unclean, maybe has some illness. Um, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains. Drains are where the water is supposed to disappear. But here the water forms pools, shui wa, instead of disappearing. Let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys. So again, air pollution slipped by the terrace the terrace is like a balcony you understand yang tai made a sudden leap and seeing that it was a soft october night curled once about the house and fell asleep so again looks like a, a dog but it really it's talking about the bad air it slowly comes down from the sky and the yellow fog stays there and doesn't go away so in a way, this is also kind of telling us about how Prufrock feels, right? The more he thinks about his situation, the more stuck he feels. 
until finally there it feels like he has no hope, just like the yellow fog slowly descending and finally covering everything. Um, so the first part of the question, why so many outdoor environments? Because the way that we think and feel about these outdoor environments is the way that Proof Rock feels about his situation. Uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about the idea of the objective correlative. The idea that outside objects can reflect inside feelings. This is something that Eliot invented. Uh, he didn't invent the technique. He invented the term, the words. But it's something that authors have been doing for uh, since forever. Um, but this is something he cared about, so he uses a lot of these descriptions to help us understand the character. What about indoor? So far, these are all outdoor. Uh, OK, so for instance, um, line 51. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. Uh, so he's saying he has spent many hours of his life drinking coffee. Uh, and in this case, drinking coffee with other people in a social situation. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall. So here a dying fall is talking about music that falls and then ends. He's comparing people's voices to this kind of music. Um, and the voice is dying. So like the conversation is ending or like he, he, he doesn't really hear the whole conversation clearly. Again, the idea that he's not really belonging to this social situation. He's like on the outside or near the outside. Beneath the music from a farther room. So in a social situation, usually the room with music will be uh, the most popular room, right? Somebody's playing the piano, somebody's singing. Uh, it's very entertaining. But here the music is from a farther room, not this room, a room far away. So again, Proof Rock is on the outside of the situation. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, I think that's mostly the the indoor. Yeah, that's mostly the indoor description is in this stanza. So we see that the indoor description is less symbolic and it's more realist. Like the outdoor description, we're supposed to think, oh, this is symbol. This is a symbol of how proof rock feels. But when we read the indoor description, this is literally where he is. And that tells us something about his social situation. Question five, is this a dramatic monologue? How does it compare to the previous two that we have read before? One group took this question uh, and they believe that this is a dramatic monologue. The whole poem is from one person's perspective. Every line is something that Proof Rock says or thinks. So this fits, that's right. Um, but if we compare it with the previous two, as a quick refresher, Tennyson's Ulysses is about an old man who had many adventures and is not ready to die just yet. He wants to have one more adventure. And the poem thinks that it's a good idea. It really gives us the feeling of wanting that adventure. Browning's My Last Duchess is about a duke who is looking for a new wife and he's explaining what happened to his old wife. And by the end of the poem, we kind of think that he killed her. And he also talks about his wife like she's just another piece of art or like a statue instead of a real person. So in that poem, we're meant to think that we're, we're not supposed to agree with the character. We're supposed to have a different idea about the situation. So Tennyson's poem, we're supposed to agree. We're supposed to, to uh, uh, feel like we're inside the situation. Browning's poem, we're supposed to disagree. We're supposed to feel like we're outside the situation. So what about Proofrock? 
are we supposed to agree with him? Or are we supposed to be looking at him from the outside? Um, so the group that took this question, they think that um, we should be looking at Prufrock from the outside, but where the poem wants us to understand him. So like in Ulysses and My Last Duchess, they both are, are trying to tell us something, right? Ulysses is saying uh, we should never give up on life, even if we're old. My Last Duchess is kind of saying, you know, uh, be careful about uh, powerful men who talk about women like they're objects. Uh, we shouldn't always trust that kind of man. But Prufrock doesn't seem to be telling us some kind of message. At least the main point does not seem to be a message. It seems to simply present this character and try to make us understand him. Why does he think this way? What kind of person is he? What kind of situation is he in? And maybe through understanding, we can have some more empathy for him. Uh, on the other hand, we just talked about the question of we. If by the end of the poem, we do start to agree with Prufrock, then that means that we have gone from the outside of the poem to the inside of the poem. We began the poem as you and I. We start to see this character. We try to make sense of him. But by the end of the poem, we have become we. We understand him so well that we find ourselves agreeing with him. We find that his situation resonates with us. Possibly. Um, but in any case, it's quite clear that this poem is doing something quite different from uh, the previous two dramatic monologues that we have read. Question six, how can you tell that this poem was written in the 20th century? We should quickly look through the whole poem. It's kind of long, so I'm not going to explain everything, but we can grab a few key ideas. Uh, the most famous line is, uh, there will be time, there will be time. Uh, not this one. Uh, and Time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. Um, so um, if you have finished the poem, you will realize that he's planning to confess his love at an afternoon tea. The visit he's going to make is he's going to visit the woman's house as they're having afternoon tea, and he plans to tell her that he loves her. Which again, this already tells us that he's going to fail. Who ever heard of a love confession succeeding during afternoon tea? Usually at least it would be dinner, right? Or maybe even later, but afternoon, uh, that's like confessing during lunch. Like, is it a, a romantic meeting or a business meeting, right? So already he, we know that he's probably not going to succeed. Um, but this tells us how he feels. There will be time to, to meet the faces that you meet. So we don't have to rush. It will happen. There will be time to murder and create. He's talking about possibilities. In his mind, he keeps thinking, uh, this won't work. What if I do that? Oh, that won't work. What if I do the other thing? Maybe that won't work. He's creating and killing different situations in his mind. Uh, and then he's saying, you know, we don't have to rush. I can keep changing my mind until we actually get there and have a toast and tea. Then he says, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair. So even when I get there, I can always change my mind. Do I dare disturb the universe? Wow. So like he's now thinking of this situation as so powerful, so important. It's like if I tell her I love her, it's like I'm disturbing the universe. I'm changing everything. But at the same time, this tells us how uh, 
convinced he is that he's going to fail. It's like the universe tells him he's going to fail. In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. So every minute he keeps going back and forth, back and forth. Should I, should I not? And then we get, for I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons, etc. So he's saying, I've been to these parties. I've been to these afternoon teas. I know what will happen. And because I know what will happen, how can I assume that I will succeed? I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. The word fix does not mean repair. The word fix means pin you to the wall. And how do the eyes put you there? Using a formulated phrase, which means they say something expected. Um, what is this phrase? We actually get this phrase later. The phrase he's thinking of is uh, here. That is not what I meant at all. Right? Like this is the polite way to uh, reject someone. Right? Not yes or no, but you misunderstand. That's what he's thinking about. And he's thinking of himself as a bug pinned and wriggling on the wall. Uh, I have known the arms already. Now he's thinking about the arms of the woman that he loves. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, which means there's no hair on the arm. Unless you look at it under the light, downed with light brown hair. Down is goose feathers. So it's comparing the light arm hair with goose feathers. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. Shawl is pijian. So he's saying, I know all these women. I know what they look like. I know how they will respond. So again, how should I presume? How should I begin? Uh, and then we have a description of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows, just like himself. And then we have the first mention of the ocean, ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. Here he's talking about crabs, uh, And then he's saying like the time is so peaceful, so quiet. Such a peaceful, quiet situation. Why would I want to disturb this with my question? Should I, so stretched on the floor here beside you and me. So our current friendship or social relationship is very peaceful. Why would I want to change this? Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? So crisis today usually means danger, but traditionally a crisis means a turning point. And that's why in Chinese we have the saying because the word crisis includes both meanings. Uh, and though I have wept and fasted, fasted is drish, it's kind of a kind of religious praying, right? Wept and prayed. I am no prophet, so I don't know what will happen. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. Uh, to flicker is like a candle and the flame is suddenly disturbed. There's an like sun. I have seen my greatness flicker, so not always great. Maybe it's going to end soon. And I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat. Uh, I don't know if you can see this on your page. The F is a capital F. In English, especially in literature, anytime a noun is suddenly a capital letter, there is always the chance that it's talking about God. 
So the eternal footman is talking about God or fate. A footman is somebody who opens the door for you. I have seen him hold my coat and snicker. So he's, it's like God is not helping me. He's simply holding my coat and laughing at me while I do this. And in short, I was afraid. So he knows that he was afraid. He's willing to say it. Uh, and then notice the change in tense. Now it becomes would. Would it have been? So he has already decided not to confess his love. Would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, guojiang, the tea, among the porcelains, the qi, among some talk of you and me? A very euphemistic way to put it. He's calling his confession some talk of you and me. Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile to like to jump in with a smile and try to be confident? Uh, in English, we say if you do too many things, then you have bitten off more than you can chew. So to have bitten off the matter with a smile to take this situation and try to deal with it with confidence. To have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead. This is from the Bible. So Jesus did many miracles. One thing that he did is somebody told him, There's this guy named Lazarus, we love him, but he just died recently. Can you help us? And so Jesus goes to Lazarus put his hand on the guy's eyes and says, uh, rise up for you are not dead. You are just asleep. And Lazarus stands the fuck up and he's now alive again. So I am Lazarus come from the dead. Come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all. So he's saying, if I did confess, she would re reject me and it would be like I died. And then I would have to come back from the dead to tell you my experience. So that he's asking, would it have been worth it to, to suffer like this? If one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. Now notice it says one. It doesn't say she. He's so afraid that he's afraid to actually think of her. He has to say one more. Um, and then he keeps thinking about this. Would it have been worthwhile? Um, now he's thinking about it from the other perspective. If she says yes, would it have been worth it? after the sunsets and the door yards and the sprinkled streets. Sprinkled means uh, wet with rain. After the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, a skirt is not always short. A skirt is simply the part of the dress that covers your legs. Tring bai. Doesn't have to be a short skirt. And this and so much more. So even if she says yes, would it be worth suffering the moment before she answers? Would it be worth suffering that waiting period? It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen. OK, a magic lantern is a kind of uh, early kind of projector. Uh, you can put pictures in it and it will use light to shine it on the wall. No, it's not worth it. I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord. So I'm not the main character. I'm only a supporting character. Almost at times, the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I think this is the 
the saddest line of the whole poem. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Trouser is pant leg, kuguan. So sometimes old people will grow smaller, and so their old clothes will be too big, and they have to roll up the legs and roll up the arms. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? So a peach at this time was a newer kind of fruit. Um, so here he's saying, I'm so old. Do I dare to do new things? Uh, and then finally he's saying, it's like I'm hearing mermaids. It's like I'm dreaming. But I have to wake up and if I dream too much, I will drown. So that's the poem. Let's look at the. 20th century and see if we see anything familiar. Psychoanalysis. Yes, absolutely. This poem is 100% psychoanalysis. Uh, he is divided among himself. He's arguing with himself. He doesn't know what he really wants. He's working against himself. The Golden Bow and Myth. Yes, he talks about mermaids. He talks about Michelangelo. A use, a lots of use of Western myths. Modernism, T.S. Eliot is right here. Yes, Dante's Inferno. Uh, the poem itself it takes some thinking to understand. Uh, yes, so it's very modernist, right? Um, it's in free verse. There is no set pattern. Each line is different from the next. There are some rhymes, but it's not regular. So it's free verse. We talked about the objective correlative, the environment. It is a kind of stream of consciousness. It's 100% J. Alfred Prufrock thinking to us or talking to us. Um, and then the magic lantern is one of the precursors to the cinema. Uh, I put the cinema, I think, in the late 19th century, but the movies really started going strong in the early 20th century. Uh, yeah, Mo that's mostly it because T.S. Eliot was early 20th century. Questions? Okay, next week we're going to read two short stories. But they are very short. That's why I'm asking you to read two of them. The first short story is by James Joyce, the dude who wrote two impossible to understand novels, but his short stories are easier to understand. Um, Araby is a story of a very young Irish boy who wants to go to the Arabic bazaar. But uh, and the reason he wants to go is because he wants to buy something for his friend's older sister because she's very, very beautiful. Uh, but he faces some obstacles, and finally, when he gets there, uh, it's not what he imagines. The thing about Joyce's short stories is that he uses many specific details. Every word in his stories is there for a reason. Uh, and so things can move faster than you expect. One moment he's describing the scenery, the next moment everything is different, and you have to pay attention to see what exactly happened. But it's not too long, right? One page, two pages, three pages, four pages, four pages, not too long. The second story is The Day They Burned the Books by Jean Rees. That's not the name. Uh, here, Jean Rees. Jean Rees was born in the Caribbean, and uh, which at the time was a colony of England. And he la she later moved to England. Uh, but this story is set in the Caribbean. And it talks about uh, a young... The, the protagonist is a young girl, and her best friend is a young boy named Eddie. And she's telling us a story that happened in their childhood. Uh, you should remember that the young girl is, I think, half black or something. The story has to do with race. Uh, 
uh, because you know English people are white, the people, the local people in the Caribbean are black, and it has to do with racial issues inside of a marriage and related to motherhood. Again, it's about something that happens and that changes the way they think about their family. And it's so this is the author's name, Jean Reese. And it's only three and a half pages. So you put the two stories together, it's seven and a half pages, not too long. So please read these two before. Not next week. Next week, I'm not here. There's no class next week. Uh, we already had a makeup class earlier in the semester, right? So next week, no class, but please finish these two stories before next next week. <laughs>